All right, everybody, welcome to session 3.4. We've already covered this material in class, but I'm going to review, well, we covered some of it in class, and I'm going to review what we covered, plus a few other concepts that we didn't discuss in class. Specifically, we're going to talk about images, graphs and charts, tables, and then something called pull quotes. All right, let's talk first about images. We, we, we discussed this already in class quite a bit, but I want to emphasize that you should only use images that enhance your message. Now, the corollary to this is that you do not use images that distract from your message. Um, it's tempting to use images because we think they look pretty, but often they're a distraction because instead of looking pretty, they make people stop paying attention to the core of your document. Uh, another problem, though, is that sometimes we have a well-intentioned image that is an image that has um, an ability to communicate but is hampered by technical details. Technical mis misuse of images can distract, and I'll show you a few examples of that. Um, first of all, the book talks about the difference between what are called vector and raster images. Vector images are drawn by a mathematical formula where raster images are drawn by, sp by specifying pixel colors. Now, there's an, um, The reason that this technical difference matters is because you can take a vector image and resize it without losing any clarity, whereas a raster image can only be made smaller. If you make it larger, you, you'll lose clarity. And so let me show you an example of this. Here are two Grantwell logos. One is a vector image. The other is a, a um, raster image. You can't really tell at this resolution the difference. Um, but if I make them bigger, you can notice that the bottom one is starting to get fuzzier. The reason it's getting fuzzier is because I'm stretching it beyond its intended size. When that raster image was created, it wasn't it wasn't intended to be blown up to this size. Um, if you're watching this full screen, you can probably see that difference, but if not, I'll make it even bigger, more prominent, and here you can really see the difference. Notice how crisp and sharp the letters are up top, and notice how blurry they are at the bottom. This is the result of, of, of uh, expanding or resizing a raster image larger than it should be. Um, if you're if you're confused or wondering about the difference between these two, especially in file types, um, generally a vector image is going to be saved as an EPS or SVG file. Some PDF files have vector images in them. Raster images are GIFs, JPEGs, bitmaps, PNGs, and some PDFs. And so you need to be careful about the way you use an image. And if you resize it and it doesn't look right, you need to either get an appropriately sized version, get a vector version, or uh, get another image altogether. So don't use raster, image la raster images larger than their intended size. And when creating images to be used in multiple sizes, either prepare raster images of each size or use a vector image instead. Logos are an example of that. You should have a vector image of a logo instead of a raster image. Now, if you're not a, a graphic designer and you don't care too much about this, that's okay. You don't have to. The point is, don't oversize raster images because they look they look blurry and distracting. Let's go back to this slide where I have a difference. There's another interesting dif where I have these two logos. There's another interesting difference besides the top one being vector and the bottom being raster. The top one also has transparency built into the image where the bottom one doesn't. And if I change the the, the color of the background, you can see that difference. Um, in the top image, the only parts that show are the parts that are not transparent. In the bottom image, in the bottom image, um, the white background is sort of built into the image, so there is no transparency. And if I change the background color, you can see the differences. Don't ever do this with a transparent image, obviously. But what you need to know about the transparency of images, in some cases, is called an alpha layer. Transparency is available in these file types, PNG, GIF, TIFF, and EPS. It's not available in JPEG, which is a common format file format. And whatever you do, just use transparent images carefully. Um, you know, the, the background might change, and if you're not careful about that change, then the image could look poorly. And sometimes, though, transparent images are great, especially in things like web design. But generally in print documents, um, you just have to be attentive to that. Um, <clears throat> I thought about doing a big expansive thing about photos, but uh, I reminded myself that this is not a photography class. So I'm going to give you four really quick tips. If you're ever taking photos to use in any documentation, make sure you use natural lighting if possible. 
open windows, um, get people outside. Use the rule of thirds, which means that you place the image on the left or right. The book illustrates that rule of thirds concept. Use a wide aperture if possible. That lets in lots of light. If you don't know what an aperture is in a camera, then you don't need to worry about it because you probably have a camera that doesn't allow you to manipulate that setting. But an aperture is basically how wide the shutter gets when you uh, take a picture. And the wider, the more light comes into it. Uh, wide apertures also do this really cool thing by making the background blurrier than what you have in focus, and that adds more emphasis to the subject of the photo. And then finally, get close. Nothing drives me crazier than seeing a big, gigantic group photo where the group only fills, you know, maybe a, maybe half of the image, and then there's a bunch of white boundaries all the way around them. Get as close as you can, and in fact, get really close if you're just highlighting one or two people. Get fill their fill the frame with just their faces. The picture will look better. If you look at all the pictures you like involving people, they're usually pictures that uh, apply these rules. Another comment on images is that header and footer images on every page are distracting. It's tempting to put a logo into the top right corner of every single page that usually is an unnecessary embellishment that just distracts it. People don't need it for orientation. You probably take up precious header space or white space by doing it. And then last of all, when it comes to images, please, oh please, oh please, don't use clip art. Just don't use it. Don't let your friends use it. Um, it looks terrible. It's distracting. It's it uh, is child childish. There's no good clip art out there. Um, newer versions of Microsoft Word have photos that they call clip art. Those are okay because they have photos, even though some of the photos can be a little corny. But uh, any of this animated clip art is just it's terrible. So please don't use it. Okay, let's move on and talk about graphs and charts. This is just a reminder of what we covered last Thursday. When you create a, a graph in Microsoft Word, it gives you this by default. And you might look at that and go, oh, that's a little boring. I need to spruce it up. And you'll be tempted to add 3D or to change the shapes of things. Don't do any of that. The whole point of a graph is to convey information. And this these sorts of changes just obscure information. So go with the old trusty, even if you think it's boring, format, which will convey the information more effectively. And also, when you're producing graphs and charts, uh, especially if you're using color, remember that your document might be printed in black and white. And if that's true, you have to be sensitive to the fact that black and white, that the colors, when printed black and white, might be indistinguishable from each other. So be sensitive to the way you format those if, you're, if there's a chance that it will be in, in black and white. So consider using graphs and charts to convey relationships between things, even if the relationships are simple. Um, avoid excessive formatting that detracts from the chart. Avoid altering the scale to misrepresent the information. We talked about that in class, but I could change the scale to make differences look larger, and that's just deceptive. Uh, finally, consider black and white appearance when formatting. All right, let's talk about tables. Um, most tables that people create by default look like this. Uh, the problem is this is not communicating nearly as well as it, could, as it can. One thing that the first probably most important change you should make in every table is that the actual content of the table rather than the header rows and columns, the content should be emphasized. So we do that here by making it bigger. Um, that top left quadrant is unnecessary, so we can get rid of that. Um, we do that by, by highlighting those borders and making them invisible and deleting the content from the cell. Um, you'll notice that the text is bunched up really close to my, my borders, and that makes it look uh, hard to read. You can use cell margins to improve that, um, so there's space between the borders and the, and the text inside each cell. Uh, the problem is if I do that, then my text size isn't working anymore, but that's okay. You can make that smaller. Don't be afraid to use small text inside of tables, especially in the headers and, uh, header rows and columns. And the reason is because people only need to read that once, and then they have a general sense of what the content of the chart, that is to say the, the, the numbers being highlighted, I, I know what they mean with, with, without having to look at the headers every single time. So I can make the header text smaller. 
the other problem with this chart is it's overusing borders. Borders are entirely optional in charts. In fact, when I'm or sorry, in tables, when I'm creating a table, I like to start the table off without any borders, and then I add them in as I feel necessary. And so here I can add these in, and you know what? That helps. That gets me there, and it's a lot less cluttered, and that's a much better looking table. So consider using tables to convey sets of information, even if the information is simple. I think t tables are underused in, uh, in uh, documents. Visually emphasize the content of the tables more than the row or column headers. So headers can be small and content should be big. And then finally, remember to use table borders sparingly. Don't, go, don't use them all by default. In fact, your default should be to remove all table borders and then add them in where you think they're important. Just another quick tip that's not in the slides, but you can also use tables to format the text on a page without people knowing that you're using a table. It's a great way to distinguish chunks of text. You can use it to simulate columns with a header across the top. There are a lot of reasons why that works really well. Okay, uh, last let's talk about pull quotes. Um, you've all seen this convention before where there's text and then part of the text is highlighted in its own little box. This is called a pull quote. Um, I use, I intentionally use lorem ipsum text, that is to say just like place filler text, in order to illustrate how that box clearly has important meaning and that's something the box emphasizes. That's pr probably overdoing it a little bit though on the box, making it too visually distinct. If I remove the border and the color background, you'll notice that I still make a pretty good call out here, I make a pretty good reference to or emphasis of what's being said. You know that visually just by looking at it. I intentionally use text that you couldn't understand to show that, yeah, there's emphasis going on here. So when it comes to pull quotes, um, use them to emphasize your message, it's especially if you're thinking that the people reading your document will just scan it. That way you can make sure that they get the key information. Avoid excessive formatting to distinguish pull quotes. It can be distracting more than it's helpful. And just one last comment, don't use more than one pull quote for every few pages of text. If you have like multiple pull quotes on multiple pages in a row, it gets really distracting and harder to read. Okay, that's it. We did it in 12 minutes, so uh, we'll see you all in class.